Here we go. Okay, back on. Don't let me hit that escape key anymore, okay, Bob? Okay. It's not even part of Skyview, but I still consider you responsible for the computer part too, all right? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about flight planning features, how to build a flight plan, and then uh, we'll finally get the autopilot to follow the HSI needle. You can slide over there, Bob, and I'll, I'll sit in this chair. Well, actually, I don't sit down just yet. So first things first, if you want to follow along, get, find your way back to the main menu. And we wanna, we're going to be focusing on the map menu because that's where all of the flight planning features are. So main menu, button one says PFD. And then we're going to select the map menu. And I want to start by looking at the info button and talk about the info pages that we've skipped before. Actually, I want to look at info for pain field. I talked about this a little bit. In this tab up here, we have airport information, and it's all the data that comes from the airport facilities directory spread across these tabs. So there's, you know, elevation, is there fuel available? Uh, here's some distance information to the airport, tower frequency, all of that stuff. And what else would I like to know? Well, I'd like to know about the radio frequency so I can move my cursor to the right by using the joystick, click to the right. Now I'm seeing a list of all the frequencies. Remember, if I highlighted one of those, I could use a button to push that frequency into the standby window of a comm radio. We click further to the right. We've talked about the charts. If I want to look at taxi diagram or instrument procedures, I would get that data here. Notice the next tab, WX. This tab only becomes available if you have the ADSB receiver attached and you're receiving data. In that case, here you see the METAR, and then below that, there are the TAFs that are in effect. And then down below, finally, you'll see winds aloft. All of this data, the winds aloft is for the nearest reporting location. The METARs and TAFs are unique to that airport, obviously. If it's not reporting weather, then you, that data would be blank. And it is possible to have no data for METARs and TAS because the airport's not reporting. When you scroll down to the to the winds aloft section, it's still going to report winds aloft from the nearest area that reports, nearest sector or whatever we call that. Let's click next tab over. It says w, RWY runway. So there's my runway information about pain field. Notice over here, again, we have what we call the secondary cursor. So I have three runways to look at. One six right. 3, 4 left. If I click the joystick up, there's the data about the, that runway and there's our crosswind runway. And then finally, if I click the cursor to the right, we get to the remarks section. And I would have to scroll up and down. Again, here I am using the touch screen to simply swipe up and down to scroll through the remarks. Make sense? Okay, so that's the uh, airport data. Now I'm going to switch back to the nearest list by pressing this button down here, button three. Obviously my nearest airport is where I'm sitting on the runway here at Payne Field. On my screen on the right, I have a list, a look at the same list, but notice I can also see nearest airports, weather stations, VORs, NDBs, fixes, visual reporting points. That's something not used much in the United States, but used heavily in Europe. And then user, USR stands for user defined waypoints. You're going to see me create a user defined waypoint in just a couple minutes. Nearest ATC facilities, nearest flight service stations. Now, if I were to switch to the weather tab, pretty good weather around the region here. Up on my slide, I've got an example of the nearest weather stations. And we actually color code and decode the nature of the weather at those stations as reported. And here's a little chart that's out of the pilot user guide. So if it's marginal VFR, it meets this de definition. We tell you at a glance, marginal VFR. That is really, really cool information. If you're flying cross country and you're saying, oh, weather's starting to look bad, where should I divert? Well, a quick look at the, at the nearest list gives you a pretty good idea of where you might want to go. That is really cool for us VFR pilots, right? 
Okay, now I'm going to sit down and we're going to build this flight plan that you see on that screen on my Skyview system. Okay, here we are. We're going to build a flight plan. So from my map menu, I need to use the FPL button, right? Button 5. Now again, you can try and follow along with some of this, but I'm not going to wait for you because we'll fall behind. Uh, but I'll try and do a good job of explaining what I'm seeing, what we're seeing. Now first of all, do you remember when we talked about this airport earlier? I said, hey, let's go direct to that airport. Anytime you use that direct to button, it creates a single leg flight plan. But I had a previous flight plan defined in here. What if I wanted to get back to that? I'm going to use the FPO menu and restore flight plan. If I were to come down here, the arrow says click to the right to choose select. Notice in this context we actually say, are you sure when you're doing things with your flight plan, we don't want you to delete things inadvertently. So in case you're in turbulence, we make you confirm that selection. So yes, I'm sure. There we go. And there's the original flight plan I had in. And it's kind of a goofy flight plan I created to just run f racetrack patterns around Payne Field. But I want you to see that it's always possible to recall one prior flight plan. Ah, uh, that's a great question. If you have an external GPS navigator, like a panel mounted GPS, you have the ability of viewing its flight plan here. You can't change it through these menus. You have to go to that navigator to change it. But you can select it and it's see the flight plan. What's that? It's like the source. Yeah, navigation. the navigation it's source. So you're a little step ahead of me, but that's what that's for if there was another navigator. Now what I want to do is start from scratch. I'm going to erase this flight plan. So I go back to the flight plan menu, button 7. Come down here, clear flight plan. I could clear it to the end. No, I'm going to clear the entire flight plan. Click once and click again. There's my blank flight plan. So next, we want to uh, select a waypoint. Well, what's the quickest way to put in the starting point of my trip? Well, I'm sitting on the runway at Payne Field. Pretty good chance he's in my nearest list. So if I press nearest, there's Payne Field, P-A-E, and button seven says add to flight plan. Press that and it's just in there. Now where do I want to go next? Well, I want to go to Bremerton Airport. I could choose the nearest list, but Bremerton might not be in this list. I don't know how far away it is. What's another way I can put in Bremerton? I'm sorry? Well, I did, but I did it on purpose. I want to show a couple different ways to put something in the list. In this case, I'm going to choose the info button here, button four, cursor down, and here's where I'm going to manually enter the airport identifier for where I want to go. K, P, I'm using the joystick to move to the next character. Here I'm going to spin in W. If I was, didn't have such big fingers, I might be using this touch screen to type on the keyboard. But anyhow, there's Bremerton. Notice button seven, add to flight plan. Now there's one last step. Many GPS navigators you've used before will always insert a new waypoint either before or after the cursor wherever you started when you, when you went to add that waypoint. In Skyview, we let you choose dynamically where do you want that new waypoint. So I'm either rotating the knob or clicking the knob up and down joystick fashion to choose the location to insert the new waypoint. Once I've got it in the right spot, I press button 7 insert, and there it is. Next, I want to go to 0S9, which I think is Port Townsend, isn't it? So another way I might get to Port Townsend would be to use my map. Now remember, if I'm in the map and I'm in the panning mode and I touch in that vicinity, you remember how the nearest list will now be referenced to my cursor because I'm in panning mode. So now when I look at nearest, well, I actually selected that one, but here's uh, Port Townsend. So I'll highlight that, button seven, add the flight plan, insert there. And then of course I want to come back to Payne Field. Is Payne Field going to be in my nearest list? So Bob says yes because I'm sitting there, but remember we're still in the panning mode. 
So I would actually have to come out to the map, exit from the panning mode, then choose the nearest list, and now Payne Field's back at the top. Did those steps make sense? So if I exit and zoom out a little bit, there's my flight plan. I'm going to go down to Bremerton, up to Port Townsend, and back to Payne Field. So your first position you show it as Payne Field. So there's my flight plan. You show it as Payne Field. Is that really what you want to do? Or do you just want to tell it to go to Bremerton? You could, uh, well, that's a good question. Would that work? Let's go in there and see. Let's flight plan menu, remove that waypoint. Okay. How do you commit okay? Just you have to click the joystick to the right. Uh -huh. uh, let me let me put that waypoint back in there. I'll put it back in like we had. Insert. So I highlighted the waypoint. Then I accessed flight plan menu. Using the I rotated the knob or joystick down to that point. This says click the joystick to the right to make a selection. You have to click it once. And then once more to confirm. So two clicks of the joystick. Two clicks to the right. Yep. And now that waypoint's gone. So now what does our flight plan look like? Well, the, you saw the flight plan exists, but I don't have an active leg or a waypoint. So I would need to go to the flight plan. And since I don't have an origin point like you described, with this highlighted, I can press the direct to button. And in that case, direct to says, wherever you're at, go direct to that waypoint. If we look at the map, it'll look the same. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. And notice the difference in symbols. Shoot, I went out. Flight plan. Oh, I want to I add pain field back in there a moment to show this. Originally, we started with active leg. It looked like this. Go from Payne Field to Bremerton. The alternative is to say go direct to Bremerton and notice how the symbol changes. The symbol no longer links that waypoint to that. Right. Now right now because we're stationary on the ground those are both the same path over the ground. But if I took off with my flight plan in in the mode to fly the leg from Payne Field to Bremerton but I take off and fly the runway heading for a ways. Later when I activate the flight plan, if it's flying the leg, it's going to intercept the leg. If instead I press the direct to button, it will go from my current position to that so next wave. There's one thing, I, one more thing I want to show you, and that is before I, when I launch on this flight, I want to go in here and visit a friend's property. And I know they're over here right by the boundary of this airspace. Now forget the select there for a moment. With the cursor flashing, I'm going to choose the map menu and choose add point to flight plan and click to the right. Now it's asking me for an identifier. This is just the, the label that will be, appear on the map and for simplicity I'm just going to call it www. I can assign a name. This name won't appear on the map. It's just going to show up in the database. I can even manually define the latitude longitude if I wanted. Say I, somebody sent me an email, hey my farm is at da da da, I could put that in directly if I wanted to. I can define an altitude, today it's reference only. It's possible sometime in the future we might, the autopilot might respect crossing altitudes, but today it's purely for information. And then lastly, I can define an icon to put on the ma map at the location of that. I'm just going to put that gray flag for there. Button 7, add to flight plan, and I'm going to assume that I want to go to that waypoint first before proceeding to Bremerton. Insert. Now my symbol here still has me flying direct to what Bremerton. That's not what I want. So I'm gonna, with this waypoint highlighted, I'm going to go back to fly, activate that leg. Okay? Now let's look at the flight plan. Get out of the panning mode. There's my flight plan, so I'm going to take off, come over here, go down to Bremerton and back. Now one other thing, notice the curved corner of this. What do you call that? We call that turn anticipation. Sometimes we use the term GPSS roll, roll steering. That's the method that executes the cutting the corner. 
the system says, hey, I know where you're gonna go next. I'm gonna cut the corner so that I can roll out smoothly on the next leg. But I said, I wanna go over that waypoint and take a photo. I should fly right over the waypoint to get a good photo. I need a way to tell the system to do that. So back to my flight plan, with that waypoint highlighted, flight plan menu, I want to toggle overfly. So when I click this twice, there's now a symbol here, OF for overfly. And if we look at the map, you can see how now the turn is anchored at that waypoint, and then it'll turn. Does that make sense? Now one thing, if the autopilot is flying, by definition, when we're using what we call this flyby, where it's going to cut the corner, if the autopilot is on, turned on and flying this, he will turn and roll out smoothly on the next leg. If the autopilot approaches this waypoint, he will literally fly over that waypoint, then execute the turn, and he's going to do what we call a button hook. He's going to do his best job, turn here, he'll fly back, intercept that course, and then go, go onward. It's just the nature. And one more thing, if the angle of the turn is so acute, it's possible that it's steeper than either you or the autopilot can or should accomplish. Now, you could say, well, if it's a really tight turn, I just have to start back here further to roll out smoothly on the next leg. Yes, but we also define some limits. We think it's not reasonable for the autopilot to commence a turn further than, I don't know, three nautical miles away from the waypoint or whatever it is. So we've built that standard in. So what you would see in that case, if it was a very uh, acute angle, you'd get to the point where the computer says, eh, now I can turn and I'm not gonna be able to turn in time. If I respect standard rate and all that, I won't roll out smoothly. So you'll get enunciation, I, I don't recall if it's on the map or on the PFD, but it'll say turn too steep. If you're hand flying, that's a warning to you. Don't try and roll out on that leg because you'll overbank the airplane. In the case of the autopilot flying, he's not gonna turn that steep, he's gonna do the button hook. Okay? So, we got the flight plan in. Got special use airspace in the way. The, the autopilot cannot respect that. He's asking, will the, will the system avoid special use airspace? Nope, that's his responsibility. Remember, I'm leaving a few things for him to do. So, the, but there are a couple ways in which you might have a flight plan defined and it's not showing up on the map. Notice on my flight plan menu, I have this button, navigate. If I, and it's gray, so it's an on-off feature. If I said, you know, I don't want to see the flight plan right now. If I turn off navigate, the flight plan still exists. There is no active waypoint. And if I look at the map, there's nothing showing on the map. I have a flight plan defined, but it's not active. So it's gone. So let's go back in, reactivate the flight plan. It's going to fly from pain field to that waypoint I define. So you'd like to think that if I were to, uh, actually what I need to do is get us in flight. So we can see what, how this all unfolds. There we are. Map is in track up. Any questions while we're getting rolling here? I'm probably about to answer your question, but I'll give you a chance. Pitch up, come on. Smoothly pitch up. I'm flying along here, and I'm going to the autopilot menu, and Bob, you could slide in here and drive for me if you would. We're climbing out of paint field. I'm still climbing. And we want to turn the autopilot on, so go ahead and reach up and press track plus alt. And I'll let go. The autopilot's going to fly. Now you reset my heading bug or track bug to there. Reset my altitude bug there. Spin my altitude bug up to 1,600 feet for me. That's pattern altitude. And we're letting the autopilot fly. But what we really want to do is fly this course. Yes? We need the autopilot to follow the HSI, but there's, I can't. Why? Because I have no needle. So this takes us all the way back to the early part of the day when we talked about the PFD menu. And it, you're still driving, so go back to the main menu. PFD. You remember when I skipped these guys here? These three buttons control the needles on your HSI and this one, HSI source. Watch what happens when Bob presses that once. 
Ah, look at this. The needle appears, and I got a data block that says the HSI is communicating with Skyview's flight plan. But in our case, active flight plan, here's the leg. The data source is Skyview. By the way, the next waypoint is here, and here's the distance to the waypoint. There's my needle, and I'm off course already. But I want the autopilot to fly that, so Bob goes back to the autopilot menu. Now notice, that button is white. I can choose it, and when he presses it, the autopilot is going to execute a turn. Now notice what's going to happen. He's off course. He knows he's off course. The autopilot will set up an appropriate intersect angle to go fly this course. That's one more really, really important distinction between the simplified autopilot and the expert. In the expert autopilot, even if you have the HSI needle properly displayed, if the autopilot is, if the aircraft is more than a certain distance off course, you cannot select the HSI mode in the advanced autopilot. You have to establish your own intercept angle by having the autopilot follow the bug, and then you have to what we call pre-arm this mode so that the autopilot will switch itself to the proper mode when it's on course. It's a simple concept, but it's an e easy thing to forget if you're not trained in that. It's one of the reasons why unless you m methodically want to use those advanced features, you're much better off with a simplified autopilot. So I designated the HSI source. And see how we're turning online or on course? Okay. Now notice, well, actually, we'll go ahead and do that. Let's go back to my map menu and look at my flight plan. Now, the, I call the controller up and say, actually, I'll get out of there for a second. I call the controller up and say, you know, it's foggy over my guy's property. I'm not going to see anything. I want to just... I want to skip that waypoint, I want to go to Bremerton. So he's going to say, okay, you're cleared as, cleared to Bremerton, then as filed. Or he might say, you're cleared as filed to Bremerton. There's some subtle phrasing. In one case, if he says you're cleared as filed to Bremerton, technically that implies I have to fly to this waypoint and onward. Or if I was already past this waypoint, I would be compelled to fly this leg. What he really means is you're cleared direct to Bremerton then as filed. So what could you do? Well, what happens if you press the direct to button right here, Bob? He thinks I'm still going there. So instead, I would probably go to the flight plan, highlight Bremerton, and then press the direct to button. See how my symbol changes? I'm not going to fly the leg from here to here. I'm just going to go from wherever I'm at direct to Bremerton. And if you exit from the, that window, you'll see how my map changed. And there he is. There's my leg. There, there we go in a, tra a north up view. There's my leg to Bremerton. Do you see how that's working? Yeah, you want to continue flight plan after that? Or do you have to go direct to the next one? Yep. Now, there's, there's one other difference I want to show you. What if I chose direct to an airport that's not currently in my flight plan. What if I said go direct to Boeing Field? Now press direct to, Bob. It's doing. Autopilot says, oh, you want me to go to Boeing Field? I will. But notice you don't see any other legs on the flight plan. And if I look at the flight plan, I said, remember, direct to is a single leg flight plan. The difference is... If you use the direct to button for any waypoint that already exists in the flight plan, it assumes that you mean to go to that waypoint and then carry on with your flight plan. If you choose direct to a waypoint that doesn't exist in your flight plan, it's a whole, whole new plan. Yep. Remember, we got that one get 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 out of jail free card, and that is to restore the flight plan. Now, what's going to happen when I restore it? It's even remembering my last active leg. The autopilot says, you really don't know where you want to go, but I'm doing my best to keep up. <laughs> now, a couple other things we need to see about the HSI. So let me grab your attention up here. One of the things about the touch display, Bob, will you touch this enunciation here? HSI goes away. Now, the autopilot 
because we've lost the HSI needle, I'm showing you two things. Number one, this box is touchable. And when you, when you touch it, it goes away. You're, you're selecting the HSI sources. When the autopilot loses HSI, it fails over to its other mode, right? So now touch this again. HSI is back. Touch the HSI mode. We're back. Now, for those of you in the back, as you were, if you were following along pressing the HSI button, I would have you find your way back to the PFD menu so we can change something. This won't work for you, Bob. But the rest of you, get back to the main menu, then PFD, go to the PFD menu, and press the HSI source button again. On all of your displays except for Bob, it's gonna, the data block is going to change and say GPS2. And you'll have a different HSI needle. So what we've done is we've switched to the next sequential data source in the airplane. In this case, it's simulating having an external GPS, a panel-mounted GPS, PFD, HSI source. There's where we were looking at Skyview. We press it again. It says GPS2. So that's as if you had a separate panel-mounted GPS in the plane, separate flight plan, and so on. Now, what happens if you press that HSI source again? Press it and see on your displays. Now you've got a green needle, and it says LOC2, localizer 2. That's simulating, for example, the nav portion of your GPS nav comm. If you had something like an external nav radio, but, or a, a that has a, a GPS and nav, the nav is one navigation source, the VOR localizer is one navigation source, the GPS is another. So in that airplane, you'd have Skyview's flight plan, GPS flight plan, GPS nav, you'd have three HSI sources. And you have to toggle through them sequentially. And you have to choose the one that's the most appropriate. If your only navigation source is Skyview's flight plan, you're going to select this as your HSI source. And frankly, you don't ever need to touch it again. Why bother turning it off? If the flight plan becomes inactivated, like let's say I go to my map, flight plan. Watch what happens when I turn off the flight plan. Now there's no HSI needle. The autopilot is going to be forced to switch itself in a moment to the track mode. There it goes. Autopilot switched to track mode. And I'll show you that on the autopilot menu. I still have the HSI source designated to point to Skyview, but because there's no active flight plan, there's no active needle. But I don't ever have to turn it on and off because anytime I activate my flight plan, my needle will be there. And when I don't have a needle, I don't. Okay? So we try and be pretty, pretty smart about how that, that works. Okay. ADF? No, there is no ADF. However, since you mentioned that, Back to the main menu and the PFD menu where you guys were. This is something we skipped before. Bearing 1 and bearing 2. If you select those, they will give you relative bearing to whatever is the active source. Whether it's a VOR radio, Skyview's flight plan. So let, let me actually do something to make this a little more meaningful. I'm going to tell, to activate this flight plan, I'm going to activate a leg where I know I'm not on course. So see, I have, I'm off course with this needle. Here's my airplane, and I've told it to fly this course leg. But the end destination is Payne Field. Do you see that? Let me get it in a state where you can see. So see, here's my course line. I said I, I told it to activate the flight plan leg that runs from this airport to that airport. Yes? And I'm way off course. I'm even going the wrong direction. Now, when I access the PFD menu, watch what happens when I press bearing one. See if you can make sense of this. Bearing one, the source is Skyview. It's the same navigator here. And the navigator can only have one active waypoint. So we know that both of these needles are pointing to the same waypoint. So what's the difference? 
And this is really important because if you ever stumble on this situation in the cockpit and you don't understand what you're seeing, it causes this self-doubt. Did I screw up? Is my equipment malfunctioning? Same source, same waypoint. So how are those needles pointing different directions? Your three bubbles off in the core setting is almost normal. Well, to the, to the, to paint. yep, you're getting a lot of the right information. But you need to understand the magenta needle that both needles are pointing to the same destination, but the tail of the needle, the origin, is completely different. In the case of the magenta needle, my origin is that airport up there, and the needle is pointing along this course, and by the way, I'm that far off course. In the case of the yellow needle, the origin of the needle is me, and the needle points to that station just like an ADF needle. So I would have to turn the airplane around, right? Now one way to reconcile this is what? If I change my flight plan to say I want to go direct to that current waypoint, watch what happens to these two needles. As soon as I say direct to, the needles, do you see how they're overlaying one on top of the other? Because now the origin of my magenta needle is here and there's the destination. Okay. So in VFR flying, you're very rarely going to use the two needles. It would potentially just confuse the situation like we just saw. If you're flying IFR, there are many circumstances in which using both needles could be useful. Okay, so I need to make sure you understand the nature of a GPS device because it'll help illuminate this concept, especially if you have another GPS navigator on the plane. So we think of a GPS as uh, uh, 296 or whatever. This is a GPS navigator, right? I use this all the time to find my way when I'm traveling. But it's three functional components. The first is the antenna receiver. This is the Skyview antenna receiver. And it gets a satellite signal, does some math, and it blurps out a lat long position. But I don't know where that is, and you don't know where it is. The west or east might help me guess the hemisphere, but that's it. So we need another component, and that's the moving map. The moving map takes that lat long position, puts it there, and draws your aircraft symbol there so you have a sense of where are you in the world. And my phone has a moving map. Skyview has a moving map. The third component is the navigator. And for our purposes, the navigator is the flight plan and all the software that allows us to create a flight plan, right? It says you're here and you want to go there, but by the way, you want to go here and here and here first. The flight plan. The navigator is that entity which allows us to create this sequence of legs over the surface of the earth. And a navigator can be either IFR or VFR. There's no such thing as an IFR map or a VFR map. That's not relevant. But the navigator can be usable for IFR or VFR. To be usable for IFR, it has to meet a whole string of TSOs. Now, likewise, the receiver can be TSO'd, and this receiver is not permitted to be the position receiver for an IFR navigator. It's not TSO'd. Landing. Who asked me about... Did you ask me about auto land? You asked me about auto trim. We don't have auto land yet, but we're not very far away. Truly, we, we need aircraft engines that have single power lever, FADEC engines, and they're, they're coming to market. Um, we, but if we add a servo to that, and the autopilot controls the servo too, I think within, well, within Bill's lifetime, we're gonna see that. A couple of you guys, you're probably not gonna see <laughs> Autoland. Uh, some of us are gonna see Autoland, I think. Okay, so usually I take a break, but I only got 10 minutes to go, so I'm gonna carry on through the, I just got about, but just a handful of slides to get through. You saw these traffic symbols before. Do we see any on, on the map up here? Not currently. Yeah, well, there's no traffic. Everybody went to bed, I guess. But I want to change my screen layout for a moment. If we had traffic and he's a threat symbol, a threat, he meets this criteria, quarter mile closest point of approach in 30 seconds, you get that yellow ball. And you saw that, we saw one on the ground when he was taxiing. And here's this trend vector. The trend vector only shows on the moving map. He, he's descending, he's above me by 800 feet. If we put him on the primary flight display, if he's within this swath of the sky, 
I don't need this vector because you visually see him moving in respect to your own position. So that's why this only appears on the map. Now, what happens if I have only 50% flight instruments? Now I can only see a 30 degree view of the sky on the PFD, but I still got traffic and he's over that waterway. So I got another symbol, this half gray symbol. I would put it right up here, but the half gray says, hey, he is really as much as 15 degrees to the right. You need to widen your visual scan a little bit to see where he's at. He's there, you need to be looking out front, but it, and increase your scan width. And then we have, we saw this symbol earlier. We're telling you he's in your proximity, but he's not converging. So he's not directly a collision threat, but he's gonna pass within five nautical miles, blah, blah, blah. And then there's the back, black diamond, non-threat. We still show him, but he's non-threat. If you're a skier, maybe you think the black diamond is a threat symbol. That's the way it is to me. But in this system, he's not a threat. Uh, you asked me about this enunciator down here. It's the status of your traffic source. I'm not going to define these. They're in the manual, but you know green is good. Red is probably bad. Yellow, you don't know. So you, you should dig into the manual if you want to know the distinction among those. Now I want to talk about the engine data. In addition to the graphical instruments we've already talked about, there's a whole bunch of textual items that can be added to the engine pages, and you have to do that yourself in setting up your Skyview. When Skyview comes to me, the default layout doesn't have any of these text values on here. Each of the three engine page sizes, there's a, remember the 100% engine, there's a 50% wide, and a 20%. Those are, we, the system considers those three separate engine pages, and you have to define each one separately. You can and should change their layout to suit you. For me, on the 20% engine page, I took a lot of information off of this page. If you look at yours, they're a lot busier. I decided to remove a few things to simplify it a little bit. On this page, I've added a bunch of text items. And let's talk about what they are. First off, over here, position near the manifold pressure gauge, there's two data values, percent of power and rich of peak or lean of peak. We're extremely proud of the algorithms we use to derive percent of power. There's some setup that you have to do to get it dialed in, but once it's there, it's a very reliable. And by the way, it's the best way to lean your engine. I talked about the lean assist mode, and I've got some slides about that. But the way we fly our airplane now, we talk about it's dangerous to run the airplane at peak EGTs. In reality, it's only it's dangerous to run the airplane, the engine at peak cylinder head pressures. Now, peak cylinder head pressures happen at peak EGTs. But if the engine is operating at 75% power or lower, the cylinder head, the cylinder pressures are not high enough to damage the engine. You can run an engine for its lifetime at peak EGTs as long as the cylinder pressures are 75% or below. So the way we lean our engine, I don't even worry about sequencing of peaking cylinders and all. We set our, our percent power at 75% or below, and then I just simply lean the engine to roughness and back in. Even in a carbureted engine, you might have enough of a spread that some cylinders are going to be operating at peak. As long as you're operating at 75% or lower, you can safely run some cylinders at peak, some lean of peak. Now, the spread of those cylinders may dictate how smoothly the engine's running, but what I'm saying is because you have high reliance on this percent of power value, if you choose to use that as a tool for managing your engine, you can do so safely, even in a carbureted engine. Now, engine management is a, almost a philosophy more than a science for some, so you have to take away what you will. But I can assure you we've got thousands of hours of feedback on how reliable that is. Works really well. Next, timers. Tack and Hobbs timers, you already know about those. By the way, Hobbs, if you run the engine for 60 minutes on the clock, Hobbs clicks off an hour. If you run the engine for 60 minutes at its normal cruise RPM, 
this clicks off an hour. But if you're doing touch and goes and half the time it's power's pulled back, this lags behind. We already know that. That's, that's why rental airplanes charge us on hobs, right? And you're saying, well, it's an electronic system. Why do you have that built-in lag? Tachometers are mechanical geared devices, and they're necessarily normalized to whatever the normal cruise RPM is. In the same way that the odometer of your car, the speedometer on your car, it's normalized to what the manufacturer says is the diameter of your tires. If you change the diameter of your tires, the gear ratio changes, and your speedometer's off, right? This tachometer would be the same way. So we could have rectified this, but historically, engines, aircraft are operated like this. Your logbooks show that discrepancy, and we didn't want to change that paradigm. So we have normalized the tachometer to a value you define and set up, which is your normal cruise RPM. 2400 for a light combing, or 2700 if you have a high compression cylinders, or 5200 for your Rotax engine. You have to put that value in, and then this will count the way it should. We talked about the fuel computer. We already went through this menu, how to add fuel to the computer. Once you've done that, then you have access to these calculated values. Range, how, based on your current ground speed, this is how far you can go on remaining fuel. This is how many gallons you have remaining at the next waypoint. This is your fuel efficiency, how many nautical miles per gallon. Time remaining, gallons used, gallons remaining. Now range, if you're trying to find the right cruising altitude for winds aloft, certainly if the range is more the winds are more favorable, your range goes up and time remaining goes up. But personally, I find that the nautical miles per gallon is a, is a handy reference for that. Because obviously if, you're, if you get more miles per the gallon, you're gonna go far, winds are more favorable. So as you stabilize at altitudes, hunting for that best wind, I find that this value is most useful of, of all. Where are you accessing all of these? Uh, again, in the system setup, you have to choose the engine layout manager. Choose, in this case, I'd be m managing the 100% engine page. And I, these are called info items. And I have to choose from a list, say, I want that one. Once he's on here, I say, I want to put him here. And this one I'm going to put over here. You have to manage all of that. <laughs> well, yeah, on my slide, I have them populated up here but you could put them down here, wherever you want. This is an, changing the engine page layouts is a feature that's highly underutilized. You know, if I've seen a hundred Skyview systems in the field where I've talked to people and looked in the airplane, I bet you not five of them have taken full advantage of getting the right information in the right place for them. So, hope you'll take advantage of that. Engine leaning, we talked about the lean assist mode. How many of you are running lo Rotax engines? Half of you? So this doesn't matter to you, but if you're running the Lycoming engine, if you, put the, if you turn the lean assist mode on, notice here's the EGTs, and we show you the raw temperatures. As you turn on the lean mode, you lean the engine yourself, and you'll see the EGTs going up. As soon as a cylinder reaches its peak temperature, we change from displaying its raw temperature to its it's offset from peak. We no longer tell you what its raw temperature is. You don't even know what its peak temperature was. All you know is, in this case, sequence one, cylinder number four was the first one to reach its peak, and he's now 10 degrees lean of that. Cylinder number one is the second one to peak, and he's six degrees lean. These two have not yet peaked. If you're trying to run rich of peak, you don't have to go any further, you're rich in the engine. If you're trying to run lean of peak, obviously you have to keep leaning until these cylinders peak as well. So that's the more traditional method of, of leaning an engine is re reference to EGTs. Again, I, I rarely use this feature now because I rely so heavily on the percent of power method. But for good engine health, it's a good idea to periodically check this because discrepancies in the timing of peaks can be pointers to uh, things like a leaking an exhaust gasket or things like that. So it's still a good system to use. And by the way, once all cylinders have peaked and you're operating all cylinders lean of peak, this value down here, 0.1 gallons per hour, that's a measure of the difference in flow between the highest consuming cylinder 
and the lowest consuming cylinder. Are any of you using the VPX power <laughs> box? None of you are? Then I'm gonna skip over that. It's an electronic circuit breaker device. Uh, we can monitor that system through the Skyview display. If you need to know more about that, give me a call. Have any of you seen the big red X's? Oh, yeah. In flight, on the ground? Yeah. On the ground. What this means is the computer is not talking to all its components for whatever reason. Out of the box, the first time you plug the system in, it's just a computer network and the computer doesn't know who's out there. So there's a process called network configuration. Basically, the display picks up the phone and says, hey, Ahar, is you out there? Why, yes, I am, and here's my serial number, and here's my software version. Great, engine monitor, are you out there? Yep, so it pulls all the network devices, and once that happens, then now you start talking and you get engine instruments. Position fail, that means I'm not getting GPS data. You could have red X's on the engine page. A common place you'll see them is red X's up here on the autopilot enunciation. Why? Because your servos are on a separate circuit breaker. And some of us don't turn the, circuit, the cir autopilot servos on. We don't turn the autopilot switch on ever, or we don't turn it on during pre-flight, or maybe we don't turn it on until we intend to use the autopilot. You need to get in the habit of switching them on because if the servos are not turned on, Skyview says, hey, somebody stole the servos. They're gone, I can't talk to them. Another common problem is you go to update the firmware. We send out, hey, here's some great new features from Dynon. Put, update the software in your, in your display. You don't turn the autopilot servos on during that software update. The way the software update happens, the computer gets it first, or the, the display, and then it pushes that new software out up to all the devices. If the servos aren't turned on, they never get the message. Next time you go to fly, even though the servers are turned on, you get red X's because they, they're talking the wrong language. Okay? So if you see the red X's, you, you're gonna call tech support. Say, hey, I got big red X's. They're, they're gonna say, did you do a network configuration? No, I didn't. We need to do that. Well, how, you okay, taking off? Okay, drive Great. safe. I really appreciate it. I hope you got, got your money's worth. Thank Thanks you. for coming. More so, thank you. So tech support guys are gonna say, do a network configuration. Well, how do they do that? How do I do that? What are they gonna say? It's in the manual. They might even throw in an adjective, especially if you call first thing Monday morning. But it's in the manual. But no, he, seriously, he will help you through it. But he'll probably give you a page reference. Guaranteed, if you get me on the phone for tech support, I won't lead with it's in the manual, but I will not let you hang up without giving you a page reference, right? Because why? Because I only want to handle your phone call once. You can call me with as many different questions as you want. But don't call me with the same question twice, because I do that at home and I get into all kinds of trouble. Okay, this is just wrap up. Uh, I don't need to call, cover all that. I hope you will take away from this some of what I've talked about, the transition from analog to digital and back and forth and respect that you can be, you can be overwhelmed by the digital data at your disposal and part of your challenge is learning to just simply look through that and embrace all this analog data that you have in front of you. I am convinced that for every one of us, if you spend a reasonable amount of time in your airplane and learn in the Skyview system, I hope you never do this, but if you find yourself trapped above the overcast coming back into Payne Field in, on a summer afternoon because the fog rolled in, I believe most of us can get down to a survivable landing by flying the synthetic vision. It's not a, an excuse to make bad decisions. And that's a tremendous risk in my judgment is pilot making decisions they wouldn't otherwise make, taking risks they wouldn't otherwise take because you have all this capability. But doggone it, if you have a roll server in the airplane, turn the dang thing on and get down safely, okay? Sharpest tool in the shed better be you. Skyview is a pretty capable system, but I left some things for you to do, right? Okay, now last thing, did we cover all of these topics? Do you feel like you know enough to jump in the plane now and operate Skyview? This is a big one. Tell you what, we'll put you on the big screen. I'm 15 minutes late, but we're almost done, Tom. <coughs> is there anything on this screen that we didn't cover? I, I did talk about angle of attack, but just to review, 
as your angle of attack increases, you're going to see the green bars blank out. As we pitch up, green bars go dark. When you get to the bottom of the yellow zone, you start to hear an audible tone. And then, like a Geiger counter, the higher your angle of attack goes from there, the faster the beep until you get to a solid tone. When I give our guys transition training in the sportsman, uh, when we get to doing slow flight, I actually turn off their flight instruments and I make them do slow flight just with the angle of attack buzzer. Because that analog Geiger counter-like presentation is all you need, right? That is direct feedback that your brain responds to now. Do you have the equivalent in the CJs you fly, Tom? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, poor guy, he, he sees more cool equipment when he comes to work here than when he hops in the CJ every day, so. If you go back to the PD, PFD and you go to bugs, it looks like they're all able to toggle these on and off. Okay, yep. I was going to try and dodge that question, but since you pinned me down on it. This menu, so for everybody, here we are in the main menu, PFD, I skipped this one before, bugs. This is a list of all those function values that can be assigned to the knob. And if you want to simplify the menu over here, then you can turn them off. If you're flying the simplified autopilot, you're never going to bother with indicated airspeed. So maybe turn that off. And you're probably, you don't have a nav radio, you can't even use the course bug. So turn that off. Now when we open up this menu, it's less intimidating. There's less noise in there. So that's what that's about. If I forget to turn those on, it'll screw me up next class. Ah, there is an MDA uh, value you can be added to the bottom of the, of the um, autopilot or the altimeter. So we covered the autopilot. Do you feel like you can turn, get the autopilot turned on and off and, and following a course needle? Okay. Did we cover the accessing the navigation data sources? My touch screen, I can touch here. On your screens, you have to get to the PFD menu and press the HSI source button. Feel good on that? And we didn't cover too much IFR. Our, we work very hard on our manuals, and I think they are truly the best in the industry, but you gotta read them. They're all available in electronic format. How many of you carry an iPad when you fly? You don't, uh, some kind of tablet. You, you don't. Any of the rest of you carry a tablet? Well, then you're going to have to get the hard copy. But you should read it. I carry them around on my iPad, and I've, I have actually referred to them in flight. Some of you have been kind enough to point out some gaps in my own knowledge today, and I probably need to go back to the manual, don't I? So I learn, some, I learn something new every time I give this class, darn it. Okay. There's a FAA handbook, Advanced Avionics Handbook, I haven't reviewed it in the last couple of years, but it's actually got some pretty good information. I don't know how much it's been updated, but it, it presents some good concepts as well. So, if, you know, looking for something to put you to sleep at night, that's a good, good menu. So that's all I've got for you folks. I really, truly appreciate you coming. A lot of people worked hard to pull this off. I hope the, the camera work wasn't too distracting. Um, they, around the office, they know, know me as the shameless beggar of airplane rides. So if you want some in-cockpit in training and you can catch me in town, I travel a lot, but if I'm around, hey, Kirk, let's go fly, and I will jump at the opportunity. I'm going to call somebody that knows you to find out how good a pilot you are before I <laughs> call in there, but I'll probably go flying with you. So we're done. Tom's got to start packing up. I'm here for a while to pack up my stuff. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, otherwise, thank you all for coming. Thank you.